Each fall since 1987, RSU has presented the Constitution Award to an Oklahoman who has demonstrated a strong commitment to the principles of the U.S. Constitution through his or her life's work. The RSU Constitution Awarded was established in commemoration of the 200th anniversary of the adoption of the U.S. Constitution. This year's recipient is the retired U.S. Army Chief of Staff, General Dennis Reimer. Welcome, sir. Did I say your last name right? You did. Thank you. It's nice to be here, Ron. Oh, thank you for coming. All right, I'm just going to real quick read a little bit of your resume, which if I had ledger pa legal pad, it would fill up several pages. <laughs> but let's just hit the highlights. And, and if you're a military buff, you'll really like these things. Battalion Advisor with Military Assistance Command, Battalion Executive Officer and Officer Operations Officer of the 9th Infantry Division, Battalion Commander of the 4th Infantry Division at Fort Carson, Commander of the Division of, of Artillery with the 8th Infantry in Germany, Chief of Staff of the 8th Infantry. Now, is that the 8th Infantry of, of um, uh, his name just, uh, of uh, World War II's 8th uh, Commander? Um, his the, name just left me. Well, the 8th Infantry Division was probably most famous for... Patton. A, no, no, Patton didn't command that division. Okay. But uh, there, there was a Brigadier General, Tom Callan, who, when he took a surrender from the German uh, forces, they asked him, where are my credentials? And he pointed to the two soldiers behind him and said, these are my credentials. <laughs> that's the, that's the, the uh, famous part of the 8th <laughs> Infantry Division. U.S. Army Vice Chief of Staff and Commanding General F Forces Command. And in 1995, you became the 33rd Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army, serving in that capacity until you retired in 99. So you were literally the big kahuna. Well, at the, at the last part, I, the way I describe it, I was on the blame line for everything the Army did wrong. <laughs> but yes, it, it, it was the, the top of the ladder, so to speak. And with that comes a lot of opportunities, and there are also a lot of challenges. Well, you're a kid from Medford, Oklahoma. How does a kid from Medford <laughs> decide to go to the military, and why did you decide to go to the military? Well, the, the why of the military was very why I went to West Point uh, and joined the military was because that that was my best way to get a college education. I mean, at that time, I didn't have enough money to go to uh, school for very long. I had a year at Northwestern State College in Alva, and that was a good year for me, but uh, where I was going to go the year after that, I didn't know. And West Point called and said, I'd actually applied to West Point the year before, and they said, we don't have any admissions, or the Congressman Paige Belcher said, I don't have any more uh, slots available to put you into West Point. But he called as I was taking my final exam at, at Alva and said, if you want to go to West Point, you got to go take the test at West Point. So I took the train from Medford to Chicago to over Newburgh, New York, came back down to West Point, took a mental and physical test, went home, and my parents said, how'd you do? And I said, I don't know. I did the best I can or I could, and uh, then a few days later, I got a letter that said, report into West Point. So that's the, the why I went there was because of the need for an education. And the how was that uh, I was lucky to get an appointment from Paige Belcher and was able to take advantage of that. Did it change your life? Absolutely, it, it was a life-changing event in, in my life. Uh, first of all, West Point was a, um, a really good education and uh, I think I learned a lot, obviously, there. Uh, it wasn't easy. There were some times I didn't know whether I was going to make it. But it also was a place where the, the values were terribly important. And what I found when I went there is that the motto of West Point, duty, honor, country, uh, was much more than just a slogan. It was a code of conduct. It was the way we live our life. And so from that standpoint alone, it was a life-changing event for me. And it uh, just happened that, uh, that I went there and I was able to graduate and then I went into the military and I ended up send, spending 37 years in the military. I owed the military, I owed the nation five years because uh, my education was mm -hmm. free at West Point. And that was a, in my view, a reasonable uh, deal and uh, so I was committed for five years, and I ended up staying 37. Within those 37 years, was there any time 
you thought, I've had enough? Well, I think probably the, the first part of that, uh, that of my career was probably the roughest. And it was the roughest because we were involved in a war uh, with Vietnam, in, in Vietnam. And it was a war that was misunderstood. It was a war that um, uh, we were running a draft and we didn't really do the draft particularly well. There was a lot of unrest in the nation about all of that. We had riots going on here in the United States. And so that was a period of time where, you know, you go through some soul searching and you try to figure out whether this is the right thing or not. And do I want to put up with this for a little bit longer? And I basically felt like I'm going to see my five years through. And at the end of five years, uh, I'd been to uh, Vietnam once. And I said, you know, it, it's going to get better as we go along. And then, of course, at the end of Vietnam, we changed dramatically the United States Army. And from there on, it was a, uh, I never had any second thoughts about getting out. Once you started to climb in the ranks and you, be, you become an executive, how much input did you have in making those cultural changes within the military so it would get better to where it's at today? Well, I think you have the opportunity uh, to make uh, more changes the higher up in rank you go. Mm. That's a given, and that's the way the Army works, it's the way the U.S. military works. But all of you, no matter what rank you are, can make changes in your own little world. And so I found that it was best for me to focus on when I was a lieutenant colonel, for example, I commanded a battalion, which is a, a organization of about five or 600 people. And so my goal there was to make it as good as it could possibly be. When I went up higher in rank and had higher organizations, my focus was always on trying to make that organization a little bit better, to leave it better to my uh, successor than when I, when I first found it. And ultimately, uh, I just use that philosophy what, in whatever I did. I don't think anybody ever enters the Army uh, saying, I want to be the Chief of Staff of the Army. I, I think that goal is not the right goal. The goal should be to try to make my part of the Army just a little bit better. I think it's true with any organization. I mean, it's all right to aspire to be the CEO of an organization, but I think in order to do that, you do it best by making your part of the organization a little bit better. But when you got to that particular position, what did you find that was a surprise to you? Well, you know, this was, uh, first of all, um, when I was asked to be the chief of staff of the Army, and there's only one answer you give, and that's <laughs> if you want me to Let do Let me that. think about it. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll get back to you in two days. Yeah. Uh, but no, what I, you know, the only answer you can give is, yes, I'll give it my best shot. And so the surprise was more about uh, the amount of change that we were going through. When I took over in 1995, it was less than, well, it was about five years after the Berlin Wall came right. down. It was after Desert Storm. We just uh, completed Desert Storm, the first war in the Middle East. And we were changing dramatically to meet a different type of world. I'd grown up in a world that was uh, the bipolar world. Our threat was the Soviet Union, and we knew everything about mm -hmm. the Soviet Union that we could possibly get our hands on. And so we organized, trained, and equipped against that particular threat. When the Soviet Union went down in the 1990s, we found ourselves in a totally different world. And we found out it was dangerous, complex, and unpredictable. And we had to do a lot of changes. So the surprise was, not only were we changing, but the pace of change was so fast. And that was something we had to deal with. Oklahomans, Oklahoma is known for a lot of people who have become famous for whatever career that might be, from astronauts yeah. to the entertainment, military. Uh, you and Tommy Franks are probably the most common of recent years. Did you know Tommy? I know Tommy very well, yeah. Is it, it, what, it's kind of unique to know that Oklahoma has produced these type of people like yourself to rise to these ranks within their own culture. Mm. of their profession. It's pretty remarkable for a state to produce that kind of, of uh, 
Yeah, but I think, you know, in, in all fairness, I think Oklahoma has a great military tradition. I mean, the 45th Division, now the 45th Brigade, has fought very well. Right. and has given earned, a lot of lives. Have, have earned their reputation and mm -hmm. they've earned it in blood. And I, I, I'm proud of all of those Oklahomans have gone before me and what they've done. Oklahoma is a state that has supported the military very, very well, and the military uh, has done well by, uh, by them. I think from the standpoint of, uh, of you imply you know, why, why did Oklahomans do well in the military? I once had a sergeant major explain to me that the military is an easy place to get ahead. They have a standard for everything. You have a standard for marching, you have a standard for rifle firing, you have a standard for physical training. And all you have to do is learn that standard and meet that standard. And if you do that, chances are you're gonna get ahead. So I think Oklahomans understand that. And they understand that uh, this is a, a, an organization in which if you, can, you can understand the standards and you can get ahead. And it's also very much a value-based organization, and people enjoy being a part of such an organization. Well, I have a laundry list of more questions to go through, but we're out of time. But if you'll <laughs> stay here, we'll do some web extra for okay. our website, if that's okay. Sounds good to me. Hey, Sam's got more coming up right after this, so stay tuned. You're watching Perspectives on RSU Public Television.